My name is uh, Memo Cedeño. I'm a doctoral student at the Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, this is my fourth year here in Harvard. And uh, since I came here, I've been studying in this uh, very interesting project uh, that uh, re tries to relate the, the perception of people and their comfort in the indoor environment with environmental parameters. What we are doing is uh, collecting environmental measurements from different dorms and uh, checking how these uh, environmental parameters correlate with the perception of the, of the students of their environment and a list of self-reported health outcomes that might be related to some of uh, uh, environmental parameters such as thermal comfort, indoor air quality, um, uh, lighting and acoustics. And uh, the, the main uh, objective, I would say, of the project is to advise uh, the university in this uh, uh, housing renewal program they have. Uh, this is the sensor that we have placed in the, like I said, more than 80 suites uh, in the different uh, Harvard houses, Leverett House, Old Quincy House, Dunster. And uh, what it does is it uh, takes measurements of mean radiant temperature, relative humidity, noise, and carbon dioxide for about two weeks and uh, connects automatically to the Harvard network and sends the data to our secure server. I think that uh, we have to recognize the efforts of the Office for Sustainability because they, are, they have a real compromise with making these places healthier, which is one of the, the um, sustainability principles uh, that they follow. And uh, I th I, I've been uh, amazed by the collaboration of the students, the house masters, the, the building managers. Uh, it's a great place to work at. All right, so my name is Mike Popchoy. I'm a graduate student in philosophy, a fifth year graduate student. And my project that the Office for Sustainability is helping to fund is on Emerson and the environment. So the idea is basically to look at um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who was uh, a Harvard student, um, an undergraduate, and then he studied divinity also, to see what his ideas might have to tell us um, in current environmental discourse, and in particular in environmental ethics, which is what I'm interested in. Um, so he lived in uh, the 1800s, and so a lot of people might think he might not have much to say to the, con the current environmental debate, which has sort of progressed a lot since then and has been on different terms. Um, but I think he has a lot of thing interesting things to say about nature and gives us a good philosophical system uh, within which to, to make arguments for the value of the natural world and the environment. So what I'm doing is looking at some of his writings um, and seeing how they might be applicable to contemporary debates in environmental ethics. So one of the main ones is arguing for um, nature having an intrinsic value. So nature, uh, natural organisms, ecosystems being valuable in themselves rather than merely um, being instrumentally valuable for human beings. Another reason I'm, I'm sort of interested in, in Emerson's thought on this topic is because so in addition to talking about the aesthetic value of nature, beauty in nature and so forth, he also portrays his ideas in a very aesthetically beautiful way. So I think that's something that could also be um, taken from his thought into the current environmental debate, is thinking about ways that we might capture people's imagination or interest based on the way that we present our information. Um, so thinking about how we use language um, in order to get people interested and motivated and convinced that this is something important to care about. And so I think someone like that who has lots of really cool quotes and small phrases is a good way to sort of get people hooked um, in a debate that can largely be very sort of scientific and specialist driven. So, What I'm doing for my project is writing a series of essays, uh, four short essays. And the first one is posted today. And there'll be one posted for each of the next four weeks throughout the month of April. So. Go to the Office for Sustainability website and check them out. Thanks. Hi, my name is Lee Murphy. I'm a junior studying organism and evolutionary biology, and I am co-founder of the Harvard Undergraduate Beekeepers Club. More of a conversation. Last time we, we were very excited because Greg has graciously crafted this thing called an observation hive, which allows you to see bees. We are very lucky to receive an OFS grant to run our project, which we are tentatively calling the Harvard Apiary. 
it's going to be a pollen project where by we collect um, pollen samples from hive locations that we're going to set up all over campus. We have um, currently one hive site, but we are scoping two or three others, and we'll be installing um, new beehives uh, about campus around mid-April. Although we had a sort of rocky first year with our with our beehive, I think with the expansion allowed um, by this grant from the OFS, we can really make sure our club um, reaches its full potential this spring and is able to you know educate more students about not only the magic of the bee life cycle, but also maybe you know have some have some great honey to share with the community. I think our first honey tithe goes to uh, President Faust, who's a, a supporter of our project at the beginning. Apparently, she loves honey. Um, but from the outset, we we hope we, our mission as a club is simply to um, educate students about beekeeping, uh, make sure that people have an experiential opportunity to work with bees while they're on campus if they so desire. Um, it's a lifelong skill, and we're just a small community of people who are, are, are learning about bees and flowers and pollination and, and how to make the campus a little bit, um, a little bit more bee friendly. <laughs> My name is Ethan Attica. I'm an environmental science and public policy concentrator and a senior in Quincy House. And I work in the Pringle Lab studying fungi, and specifically how Neurospora crassa, which is a fungus, a filamentous fungus, detoxifies formaldehyde. Now, formaldehyde has been considered carcinogenic or probably carcinogenic by the World Health Organization. And it exists everywhere around us uh, in both the natural environment as a result of forest fires and also in the human environment. We encounter it in composite wood products, in particle board, in brown paper bags. Uh, formaldehyde comes from cigarette smoke and combustion sources, and also industrial sources, like uh, wrinkle-resistant fabrics and carpeting. So formaldehyde is everywhere, and as something that can be an environmental health concern, I think it's important to understand how nature deals with formaldehyde, and then how this system, uh, Neurospora crassa, can deal with formaldehyde in nature as a fire adapted species, and then also how we might be able to apply that to think about how formaldehyde in the human environment can be remediated or altered. Formaldehyde has been a, a big focus of mine in my studies here, um, taking environmental health with Professor Spangler. Um, we focused on different environmental toxicants like formaldehyde, aldehydes, uh, PCBs, and other chemicals in our environment. So looking at this project, specifically after taking Professor Spengler's class and, and thinking a little bit about formaldehyde and its sources in the environment, my senior thesis research has been focused on applying uh, some genetic tools to look at how this species of fungus deals with formaldehyde and then characterizing the biochemical pathway by which this fungus detoxifies formaldehyde. Now, the last question that, that I think was interesting and that we looked at in our research was, um, now that we have this system, which is the Neurospora crassa fungus, that deals with formaldehyde, can we think about what the mechanism of toxicity might be? Now, formaldehyde is known as something that's genotoxic, that links uh, DNA and protein or cross-links DNA and causes mutations. Now, while that is one mechanism arising in car carcinogenicity, maybe formaldehyde is harmful in another way maybe it impacts another part of the body, and maybe we're not looking for that. And in Neurospora, we found that formaldehyde didn't have such a big impact on cross-linking uh, proteins and DNA to the cells when they were cultured with them. But formaldehyde did seem to change the levels of glutathione. And glutathione is something that helps us fight oxidative stress. So maybe the real impact of formaldehyde over the long term is creating oxidative stress in our bodies. Now, our body's very, very good at breaking down formaldehyde. In fact, formaldehyde is necessary for almost every living organism. Our cells produce it. Uh, in my blood right now and in yours, there's 2.5 micrograms of formaldehyde per every mill of blood. So the question isn't so much uh, whether we can completely get rid of it, but what is, what is the, the optimal level, I guess? What is the, the right level? And how can something that we need for life that's important in in creating uh, the macromolecules that support life be harmful to us at some concentration. Very, very, very thankful to the support that we got uh, to help us explore this. And um, 
really delve into into the issue a little bit deeper and make this not just you know a, a mycology project or not just a biochemistry project or a genetics project, but really an interdisciplinary project that help us uh, helps us focus on an environmental issue. Uh, hi, I'm Abhinay Sharma. I'm studying Masters in Design Studies in Energy and Environment at Graduate School of Design. And I'm interested in sustainable design and sustainable strategies. Uh, hi, I'm Kanika Arora. I'm a, I'm a first year Masters in Design student uh, at the Graduate, Graduate School of Design, specializing in energy and environments. I have uh, an architecture background and have worked previously for over five years in India. Uh, prior to coming here, I also worked on some of the lead projects uh, in Delhi. Hi, I'm Rohit. Uh, I'm doing my Masters in Energy and Environment at uh, Master of Engineering. Um, so my focus is looking after the environmental impacts of aircraft emissions. Um, I'm doing this with MIT. So this project that we worked on was uh, a competition entry for NESI competition, which is the Northeastern Sustainable uh, Energy Association competition in the Residential New Construction Division. We were given a site uh, at South Holyoke in Massachusetts and we were supposed to build uh, 60 residential dwelling units on it and the eventual goal was to have them net zero. In our minds, what our eventual goal was to go beyond net zero but net positive energy and so to incorporate those strategies, we wanted to find the intersection between the, the environmental, economic and social aspect of sustainability and target the triple bottom line as a whole. The competition asked for a net zero energy trading design but what we did that we went a step further ahead and we designed a net positive energy building. So we did that through various passive design methods and active design methods. So starting from the bare, the first step of the concept, we designed the massing of the whole building in a hierarchical model in which we had the highest point on the northern side of the site. This provided us the opportunity of utilizing the maximum southern and uh, eastern sun. Uh, through which we were able to get ample daylight within the building itself. The other strategies include, uh, included uh, following the passive design house standards in which we provided uh, insulation to the building through which we were able to cut off uh, heat loss through the envelope of the building. Uh, we also utilized natural ventilation potential on the site. The solar chimneys were oriented to the southern facade through which we were able to ventilate the building throughout the year and through this natural ventilation, we were able to cut off the cooling cost uh, during the summer months, which was uh, which also helped us a lot in uh, achieving our target of net energy positive. Uh, as an active design uh, measure, we also had uh, energy cores installed in the buildings. Uh, this was an approach of moving away from the centralized heating uh, system, which uh, costed a lot of heat loss uh, through the transmission uh, process. So these separate cores allowed us to separately uh, heat and cool uh, different sectors within the site. To measure and assess uh, these uh, interventions, we also used uh, building information modeling software and computer simulations a lot. And we were able to prove that all these active and passive design strategies were actually helping us reduce the energy cost and in fact achieve a positive energy on site. So with the techniques described by Amina and Kaneka before, we already brought our residential building to the passive standard, but as a goal was to uh, bring it to the net zero energy building level. So we uh, introduced new renewable technologies in the form of uh, solar panels and geosource heat pumps. For solar panels, like we used, we assumed the most efficient method, the most efficient available method, which was coming out to be around 15%. And and we now you can see this graph. We built this graph to show uh, relationship between the energy consumption um, and the cost required to bring it down to zero zero energy. Um, and as you can see that at the introduction of each new technology, we see a decrease in energy uh, requirements, but we also see an increase in the cost. So this gives an idea, like okay, given the budget we have, we can actually. Um, we can actually play with these technologies to come into our budget and still achieve our zero energy standards. Uh, we decided to not go with geosource heat pump because it was becoming uh, economically unfeasible and 
Also, like you can see in the graph, if you add geothermal heat pumps, we are actually producing a lot of net energy which goes to the grid again. We also use rainwater harvesting systems um, to further bring down our water usage requirements. So as much as it was important for us to do the energy and the economic cost benefit analysis, it was also important for us to do the social impact benefit analysis. And uh, so this, so the social side of sustainability was quite inherent in our design strategies. And taking forward the South Holyoke Revitalization Plan, we wanted to incorporate the strategies that could further revitalize the neighborhood area, provide job opportunities for the people in the area, and sort of like uplift.